Hello and welcome everyone to On the Real Side. And uh, very happy to have today as our guest, one of the great bass players uh, in this world and uh, a very, very versatile and, uh, and genuine, complete musician. I mean, he's a jazz musician, but, but Jay is also, uh, you know, has, has seen a lot of worlds and a lot of interesting, I didn't even realize the amount of things that uh, this fellow has done. <laughs> and uh, uh, I find him a fascinating person. We've known each other for some time and, uh, you know, a terrific musician. So we're very happy to have Jay Anderson with us today. Hi, Jay. Hey, Bob. Thanks for having me, man. It's really oh. great, great to see you, and I'm flattered. Well, it's, it's great to have you here. And uh, I was <laughs> sincere. I, I didn't realize I've known you from a few contexts and, uh, you know, hadn't realized the extent of, uh, you know, how wide your, uh, your range uh, is. One thing I did notice that's interesting before we'll get, we'll get into your background and all that thing, all, all those things that make, make up who you are. But, you know, there's a, you have many long associations with people. That's one thing that in, in reading your, you know, your resume and your background and your story, you know, I think it's a wonderful thing that you've had such a, a long lasting relationships with so many people. And there's a lot of people we could just, uh, we will delve into, but you know, I, I noticed that uh, certain, certain people, for example, um, well, one thing I want to say, you've got with various people, I counted 57 releases, and that's the ones that are mentioned in your Wikipedia, just on steeplechase label alone. So with, with many different different artists, but, um, you know, for instance, you had um, with, with Vic Juris, the wonderful guitarist who just left us, uh, you had a relationship basically from your first recording with him was 1992, and wow. your last one was, two, was 2020. So that's uh, quite a long time. And, uh, you know, we'll discuss all of these in detail. For example, Rich Perry, I think you're from 1995 to 2019, unless you've done one in the last couple of years. We did, we did do one uh, last year. Right, so you know, you've got all, the, all those to the present. Maria Schneider, uh, I believe uh, from 1994, you know, intermittently, but, but sometimes consistently to, uh, again, to 2020, or you may have done something with her last week for all I know. No, I think the la she released something uh, this, uh, this year, but it was like kind of a best of Maria uh, LP uh, project. So, uh, uh, so that was released recently, but it was recorded over the last 30 years. Yeah, and you know, other people, Mark Soskin, and then you've got several records with Stanley Cowell, and you know, it, it, it kind of goes on. We won't get to everybody at this moment, because I'd like to just go from uh, start out uh, with your origins. You know, you you grew up in Southern California, Northern California, Southern California, Southern California, and that was in uh, um, what 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 city were you in? in Maine, Los Angeles, or no? I I, uh, I joke. I grew up behind the orange curtain in uh, uh, close to Long Beach. Long Beach is kind of close to my heart, but I actually grew up in Anaheim, about 20 miles from Long Beach. Um, and uh, that's where my folks moved for to find a better life for themselves from uh, South Dakota. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I was I was really lucky to have great uh, band directors, you know, but the my you know, as we talked on the phone the other day, we all have our stories, you know, and where I came from, um, there wasn't a lot of music happening. Um, my mom uh, played mom piano, you know, the very, 
very talented. You know, she had perfect pitch and she'd hear a song on the radio and play it right away and change keys. And uh, really? up, until, up until she died, which uh, at 94, about uh, nine years ago. Oh. Um, so she was super gifted and my parents were very supportive of me. And um, <clears throat> as were my uh, junior high and high school uh, band directors, my junior high band director is the one that kind of got me playing the bass. Um, uh, had you played something? Did you play piano because your mother did? And did you? Uh, we gave that a shot. You know, my mom and I were like too similar. I forget how old I was. I, I guess I was maybe in sixth or seventh grade. And it just didn't really work. You know, uh, I was probably a pain in the ass. And so that just kind of faded away. But she knew I was interested in playing music. So she actually went to the junior high band director. His name was Joe Bearden and said, my son wants to play music. Well, you know, what do you, what do you think? I kind of wanted to play trumpet or something. I didn't know, you know. Right. He literally came home with a bass. He gave her a bass and said, tell him to play this, like the, the, the school's bass. And I was kind of like, what the, you know. And, and how was, old were you? You were? I was like in seventh grade. So what is that, like 13, 12? Well, that's interesting. You're a, you're a tall guy. And maybe the, the music teacher might have said, well, he's a tall kid. He probably could play that. <laughs> I mean, and, I don't know. well, and you know, he was uh, he played the acoustic bass, and he did a lot of club dates and that kind of stuff on his off hours from school. And he told me, you know, he gave me names of people to listen to. And he actually, when he passed away, his uh, uh, wife gave me one of his basses. It was a real old K bass. It was a great bass. And so he was a real. Um, mentor and even when I as you know when I played with Red Rodney and Ira Sullivan uh, he and my high school band director came to the gigs together in LA when you know uh, we played at a place Car uh, Carmelo's it was called uh -huh. and uh, they came and it was so great you know, they, my, my high school band director uh, Don Gunderson is still alive and we were uh, in communication and he's still just supportive of God knows how many of his uh, former students who went on to play music or or not. You know, he was just a, a very supportive, uh, giving guy. You know, so I'm lucky. My parent, lucky to have my parents and those gentlemen to to kind of uh, get me started. So, what was your father's? Uh, okay, he came from Dakota, South Dakota. Yeah. And he settled in L.A. And what was his um, his profession or his job? Well, they moved to Southern California kind of because they just wanted to get out of South Dakota. And, you, know, you know, they loved South they had Dakota. Had real ambition. Yeah, yeah. just I mean, they didn't know what they were going to do, but they moved to Southern California to be close to my mother's brother. And they opened a little ki kind of uh, corner store, you know, a little oh. neighborhood deli kind of thing. <clears throat> and um, had a little butcher counter and he did some of that stuff. And then uh, he, what he really wanted to do and what he ended up doing, uh, this is in Ontario, California, um, worked at a stationery store at an office supply store. Um, and then he uh, moved to Anaheim to start his own business. And that's how he ended up there. I see. What is the first music that you remember kind of being attracted to and listening to, you know, I mean, I remember hearing Frankie Avalon's Venus and I kind uh, of was attracted to it. And I, later I realized it had chord changes. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It actually had a bridge that went through a couple of keys. Yeah, yeah. But, um, I, you know, they would, they, they played like Ray Conniff and Herb Alpert and, uh, um, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, this was your parents. Yeah, yeah. There was music around, but it wasn't like they were playing Mingus or, or uh, that kind of stuff. I, I kind of discovered all that on my own, you know. Did you, were you into first? Were you into some kind of rock and roll? Like, and I was into like, oh, Little Richard and the Everly Brothers, and you know th that we, kind of stuff. Well, I do have a quick anecdote, and I'll make it fast. That's but I, I, I was a Boy Scout, and I was, you know, you get merit badges, right? So. I went to get the physical fitness merit badge. And it was like an older guy and I did whatever, you know, he asked me to do. 
So afterwards, we were hanging out, and he said, you are filling out the paperwork. He said, so what are you interested in? I said, well, I, I like music. And I was, you know, probably ninth grade, 10th grade, I don't know. And um, he said, well, what instrument do you play? And I said, well, I play the bass. And his face kind of lit up. And he said, well, what kind of music do you like or play? I said, well, I like classical music and jazz. And of course, I barely knew what either was. But he said, he said, well, do you like any like rock music? And I said, well, not really, but I like this band Blood, Sweat and Tears. And his face lit up and he said, I have somebody I think you'd like to meet. So this is in Anaheim, California. He went in to the back room and he came out with his son, Jim Fielder, who was the bass player with Blood, Sweat and Tears. Oh, that's funny. And, and I was just, you know, I mean, I'm getting chills just t telling you, you know, I was so bass player of all things. Yeah, in, in the in the band that I liked, you know, the one rock band that I liked. So, you know, I guess um, there's some sort of fate or whatever you want to call it. But uh, so, did you get to hang out with him? And did you? Did yeah, he for ten minutes, he was really nice, and I said, "Oh, I really like your bass line on uh, Spinning Wheels," you know, or whatever. <laughs> and he, he was nice, and then he went back into the back of the house, and I left, and that was that, you know. Well, were there? Let's on along those lines. When you uh, did, you have like a well. You said one of your teachers played bass. Yeah. Did you have like a, a mentor in your early days of playing that kind of turned you on to how? Uh, you know, uh, to the direction that you kind of finally went in? Well, I think, you know, just playing, you know, I, I actually played tuba also, just because my high school band needed a tuba player, they handed me a tuba. And I think tuba, people maybe disagree, but tuba like bass is easy to play poorly and difficult to play well, you know. So uh, I picked it up pretty quickly. I played in the marching band. My friends were in, in the, the band. I played in the stage band. And by in, in the doing of that, you know, we'd play uh, uh, Count Basie arrangements and uh, other things. And I just said, man, I really like this, whatever it is, you know. And I ended before the internet and everything, but I, I kind of uh, just somehow heard of Charles Mingus and Ray Brown and heard these names and I'd go, I'd buy records with them on them. You know, Did you before hear them I had, you started to buy Downbeat Magazine or something like that or? Yep, and I got, I got Downbeat Magazine and I remember, you know, when you'd buy a Downbeat, you'd get a free um, record that was like on the Downbeat poll that, that year, you know, so, uh, and I had heard of this band Weather Report and it, it, it was their very first record, which was really quite out there, kind of like Bitches Brewish. Yeah, I remember. Yaroslav and, and that band. And um, and I got the record for free. And of course, I had no idea. You know, I was like, what the hell is this? That's, you know? that's free Jocko Weather Report. Right. It was with Miroslav. Miroslav was on days and, uh, you know, I've, I had no idea what it was. But of course, now, you know, I, I love uh, that that version of that band and later versions, but that was kind of one of my first records. And the other first record, I'll just tell you quickly, and I just, I don't post much on Facebook, but when Quincy Jones died, uh, I felt compelled to post that uh, Walking in Space, Walking in space. That was, the, was the first, was the, killer was, the joke. first was, the, was the first record I ever bought with my own money. My parents took me to the record store and I bought that record because I know Ray Brown was on it and um and I Killer Joe exactly I still put that that cut on for almost all of my students and I just say you know it's it's it's, it's different from him playing with Oscar and, and all the other hundreds thousands of records he did but the, there's something about his playing on that cut on that record that is so, uh, it just got me, you know, and in retrospect, and I put this in the Facebook post, is just his time, his attitude, his notes, his uh, orchestration, um, just, you know, it, it's like loud in the mix, so it's like you, you can't help but listen to him, you know. So yeah, that was- I, the, I played one concert with Ray, with Walter Bishop, uh -huh. in, uh, in Tel Aviv, Israel. Wow. 
and it was uh, the only time I ever got to work with with Ray. And they're actually they're thinking of putting this record out because somebody recorded it and it's pretty well recorded. And a, a French drummer named Philippe Swarat. Mm. Uh, Roy, Roy Hayes was supposed to make it, but at the last minute he didn't make it. And uh, this drummer did a very fine job. But uh, one of my high points of my life was the rehearsal in the afternoon, rehearsing with Fish and Ray Brown and discussing the changes to Dancing in the Dark and my uh -huh. life. And, and seeing all the ways that those cats could approach it. You know, all, Ray was yeah. like a thesaurus of every change. Well, we could do this, we could do that, and later, why don't we, you know. And uh, it was such an educational experience, you know, and, and, and the deepness, the depth of the swing oh. was the other thing. I mean, like just how you were just dancing the way he, yeah. he could do that. So to just re relating this to my other mentors, when I was in college at Cal State Long Beach, uh, my ba you know, I was studying classical bass because you, I'm embarrassed to say, it was kind of before you could get a degree in jazz, you know. Yeah. So I studied classical bass, and my teacher's name was Abe Luboff, and he was at one time in the uh, Los Angeles Philharmonic and uh, tons of studio work. And he was a friend of Ray's. And when Ray would kind of want to hone his Arco thing, he would take lessons with Abe. And they were good for John Clayton actually studied with Abe too. And um, so they were buddies. So he brought Ray in to do a workshop at my college and he introduced me to him. And that was just another amazing thing to just sit 20 feet away from Ray Brown and talk to him and watch him. And, you know, that was probably. Oh. 77 or something like that you know oh that's beautiful so you would have been uh about 23 22 23 at that something time. like that yeah yeah right, right before i graduated did you have any siblings by the way or are you no 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 siblings you were i like to say when my parents achieved perfection they stopped having kid children <laughs> yes i think that that's <laughs> right a good now. way to think of it a good way to think of it there you go and uh you know, so you um, did you know? Did you consider doing something else when you you were there? You were in college. Did you know you wanted to be a musician? Like, when were you sure of it? I was pretty sure in college. Um, you know, there were there were actually a lot of really talented people at my school. You know, it wasn't North Texas State or whatever, but um, or Berkeley. But my band director there, his name was John Prince, and he wrote some arrangements for the Tonight Show band and a, a really talented saxophone player, Tom Kubis, an amazing arranger, a composer, was going to school there. Dan Higgins, who's ended up being one of the top studio uh, alto players in L.A., um, Brandon Fields, uh, David Witham, my good buddy, piano player, Jim Cox was also a piano player who went on to be one of LA's top studio players. So I was around a lot of great music and musicians. Mike Higgins, a guitar player, who's uh, David Witham and Higgins are we're still very close to this day. We talk every week or so. And um, um, then I tell my students, you know, I teach at Manhattan School of Music at Jersey City University, and I tell them, you know, nurture these relationships of these people you're playing music with and try to meet as many people as you can because these are very likely the people that you're going to be playing with for the next 50 years, if you're lucky, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so it was, it was a nice scene. And to answer your question, yeah, I kind of knew at that point that I wanted to play jazz music which i was still really kind of discovering what that what that was you know and just like everybody you know you talk to your friends and we all had lps and we uh, talk about different bands and different music and um, uh, uh, discover jazz and other music together you know well you know one of the advantages of being in a place like la you know or new york or even you know chicago detroit is you have all these wonderful it's like a beautiful garden of musicians all around you, you know, and, and uh, you have mentors who aren't, aren't just people that play your instrument, but you, sure. 
So sure. for, for me, it was, um, you know, in retrospect, you're, you're absolutely correct. But, you know, I graduated from college and a week later, just by really sheer luck, I got called to play with Woody Herman. And uh, did you ever, I forget what big bands you played with. And I played with no big bands. That's why you play so great. No. <laughs> well, I don't double and uh -huh. I'm a terrible reader. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I can write music. Uh -huh. I can't sight, I hate sight reading. Okay. I, uh, my father was an excellent reader. I won't go into my whole psychological love makeup, but my dad was lead trumpet with Tommy Dorsey. Oh, okay. He played with Charlie Spivak. He had his own big band. And he could read, as we said, he could sight read the circus. <laughs> and, and I could not. And he used to get mad at me when I couldn't read right as he was teaching me. He was, my dad was not a gifted teacher. I think, I think one of the reasons I've become a pretty good teacher is all, everything that my father did, I don't do. Uh -huh. Like, I have much more patience with people messing up than he had with me. Because I'm pretty fearless with music, but put a piece of music paper in front of me, put a, a sheet, you know, sheet of music, and I have one minute of total terror and panic. I've learned to disguise it where people don't see. You, you told me about that, um, at that one gig in, uh, at Harvard with Red, Rodney. Right, that's right. Red stuck all that originals, originals in front of me, so you know. So you've experienced that through me, you know. I mean, I mean, you you seem completely cool. You know, I I actually, you know, for better or worse, I'm actually a pretty good reader. Um, I can't read fly shit at a thousand paces, but I, uh, I I feel like that is, you know, when you talk about being able to do different things, you know, at my core, you know, whatever it means, I consider myself. A jazz musician you know and i try to uh approach everything i play and just trying to make the music sound good you know but i can read and i think that has helped me uh in different situations you know yeah well i mean it's it, it helped me I, mean, I remember when i was on mingus's band it was so funny one guy would come in and there was sometimes a bit of racism from some of the the black cats who would come to listen to us one guy came in one night this guy john blair violinist mm -hmm. And John, maybe he mellowed, but at that time he was basically, he, he would literally tell me, this is not your music, you should do something else. Oh, uh -huh. play another kind of music, play classical music, do this. And they say, you know, now Mingus got everybody on the band for a certain reason. He got George Adams, because George got this this deep Southern roots and this soul and this and that. He's got this guy, that John Paul, that and that. And he got you, because you can read. <laughs> and, well, you can do other stuff too, but I guess he had that wrong, right? Yeah, right. I mean, I was like the, probably the worst reader on that band, you know, but, but it was like, a, you know, it was like, yeah, and, and I, you know, and you like fried chicken and watermelon, you know, white guys can read and, you know, we have, a, you know, it was kind of a funny thing. But um, so you, you got Woody's, I mean, you went on Woody's band. And that was really your first, uh, I guess you played a few club dates, you played a few gigs, but yeah, I had played like I had started doing club dates you know uh, that kind of stuff and in california they call them casuals it's the same thing as gb in boston or a club date in new york you know, the cats used to call them casualties i remember that <laughs> yeah right so so i was doing that but you know i that was a great experience you know playing by ear learning tunes uh playing in front of people you know knowing what people like and don't like and um you know trying to do a good job for somebody that's hired you to play music you know yeah, so, that, so that so I, I was that was kind of and I, I had a friend who fancied himself a, a uh, promoter so when I was young he hired me and some other guys to play at a music store a little concert he put on with Bill Watrous oh yeah and then another one oh, oh man who did he um I'll, I'll think of it, but another concert that he put on where I was playing with uh, guys that I should not be playing with. But, you know, again, because I was fairly musical and could bullshit pretty well, uh, I p pulled it off, you know. Sure you did. Um, <laughs> you did better than that. But, but like a week after I graduated from college, I got this call from Woody Herman. And, and as you probably know, with those gigs, you don't really go and have an audition. The, the gig is your audition, you know. So I. I flew to Syracuse, New York. I had never been 
like east of the Mississippi, you know. Had, put, had you flown before, you know? I had flown like twice, I think. Um, and uh, so I had all my stuff and I actually played, I wasn't into electric bass, but I had one because you kind of had to, to do At both. Time, you know? something, yeah. So uh, I brought all my shit and I got on the bus in the morning. It was like a cloud of weed, you know, introduced myself to everybody and you know, Joe Lovano was on the band and John Riley, a uh, great drummer who I still play with to this day, uh -huh. still a dear friend. Um, who had to recommended you? How did you, what was the uh, network that kind of got you on that band? I, I'm, I, I think it was, they were in LA and the road manager somehow called, I think a bass player named John Gianelli. I knew John Gianelli. And I, and I think he the jet yeah, maker, and uh, we were in uh, San Diego at the catamaran and we had um, Harold Danko and Chet and I and uh, flute uh, saxophone player Jacques Belzer had gone over there and uh, we got uh, John Gianelli who took me to Tijuana to go oh. shopping one day and uh, I'm terrible I don't know how to bargain like somebody would give me a price and I'd say, I, I was ready to pay the full price. And he'd say, no, man, let me show you how you do it. And oh, you know, uh -huh. yeah, well, for that price, I'll, I'll take three of them. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? And yeah, right. John was good at that. So you knew John. Well, I didn't, I didn't know him. Um, but I guess he had heard about me. And I guess, you know, if you're going to go on the road for a year, it's probably not going to be a guy who's 40 years old with a wife and three kids, you know? Right. And I was 22 or 23, and um, it was 78, so yeah, 23, I guess. And, I, and, I, and you know, I actually was really into Woody Herman's band because growing up where I grew up, you know, there were no jazz clubs. Yes, there was stuff in L.A., but L.A. was far away when you're 18 years old, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, I would go with my friends to Disneyland, and they had big bands i heard buddy rich there stan kenton woody herman uh i forget who else we would we would sneak in and i i actually really loved woody herman's band and another one of the first records i bought was called the raven speaks uh and like alfonso johnson oddly was the bass player on it and uh i think it may have been danko i f or i think it was danko um, who is, of course, a dear friend of mine. I, we play a lot of music together um, at this point. But anyway, um, right, so yeah. when, when they called me, I was down. I was like, Woody Herman, that was like kind of a dream. Cool. You know, that was something that was within, uh, in my imagination, something that maybe I could do, you know. So I did it and I brought all my shit and I didn't go home for a year. You know, I, just, I got the gig and I stayed there for a year. And um, when we find, and I never came home, just on the bus the whole time. We did go to Europe a couple times, and um, uh, but when I finally did work our way back to California, I thought this is time for me to cut. So I, I gave my notice. And it was almost two years you were with Woody, right? Like sort of it like was really about a year. It was only a year. Um, but you know, I, like I said, I was on the road that entire time of that year on the bus and uh, and, and then was carmen mccray your next uh so. yeah then i then uh, you know i got off woody's band and now i was in long beach i had my own place and um uh, you know most of my friends hadn't been on the road with a, a well-known band you know so when i came home i was fairly busy working and um uh a guy named Marshall Otwell, a great pianist who I think he lives in Monterey area and now he does some sort of IT stuff, but he was and I'm sure still is a great piano player. And he was playing with Carmen with Joey Barron and Ed Bennett, a bass player. And uh, Ed too, in Oregon. Oh, okay. Yeah. And ended and, up in Portland. Okay. And so she, she was looking for a bass player and Marshall said, Well, I know this kid, you know, so. Uh, went up to her house and played with, with her and a drummer named Mark Police and she dug us and she hired us. And um, 
So then I did that for two years, you know, um, again, probably long before I was really ready to do that gig. And I think like many of us, you know, it's not until years later when you realize how lucky you were to, to play with her, you know, um, so, she, you know, that was a whole education for two years, you know. How was she, um, I mean, uh, you know, she scared me. I used to have dinner sometimes in New York with Richie Kamuka. Oh, uh huh Living at 780 Greenwich Street. That was one of her, that was her East Coast place. And she had her houseboy, Jason. Oh. Was Jason around? I don't you know. But... No, at this point she was living kind of like a movie star in the Hollywood Hills. She had a beautiful house on a hill overlooking all of LA. And, um, you know, she knew some famous people and um, uh, she'd had parties and her rhythm section would play at the parties and these more TV stars than movie movie stars. But um, like, uh, oh, who's the guy that played Mel on the Dick Van Dyke show? Uh, Richard. Uh, yes, um, Richard Oppen. Uh, uh... Not often. Uh, Deacon. Deacon. Richard Deacon. That's right. You know, like guys like him and uh, just people I had seen on TV were there. Uh, Mel's and, name was Oppenheim. Mel Oppenheim. Right? That's how I thought of it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. the, the character of Mel was Oppenheim. exactly. So you know, anyway, I watched Dick Van Dyke the other night on television. He's I'm ninety-nine. Sorry? Dick Van Dyke was on TV the other night. Oh yeah. And he's ninety-nine, and he was dancing. Oh my God! And he was lucid. He remembered his whole life. You know, he was. It was amazing to watch. It was like you know Benny Carter. Same thing. They just have genius. You know, like uh, f the physical comedy. Just you know, like uh, uh, Michael Richards, the guy who played Kramer on Seinfeld. You know, just amazing physical comics. You know. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So anyway, playing with parties Carmen was great, and you know, people were like, "Oh, well, I heard she could be a drag." You know, she was uh a total groove to me she was nice she we had one run in I, it's a long story and i won't get into it but it had to do with the clothes i was wearing we were at, at a club in new york called marty's for three weeks and she was staying like at the you know the whatever and i was uh staying on my buddy's floor at 440 10th avenue you know and so i had a nice jacket and some ties but and shirts but, you know, I had the same jacket every night and she <coughs> got bugged at me for looking at the same jacket for three weeks. She thought I just didn't change my clothes for three weeks, you know. So we had a run in and I basically stood up for myself and I said, oh, hey, if you were paying me more bread, I'd have more clothes. But I'm sleeping on a guy's floor. And, uh, you know, this is, you know, what I, I can afford. And from that moment on, she treated me like a man. You know what I mean? She was like, oh, I, you know, I mean, she was always nice to me, but I was a boy. And then when I stood up to her in a, in a good way, and it was a really cool life lesson, um, how she, her, her thing shifted. You know, she treated me not like an equal, but, you know, I was still. <laughs> not a, she didn't patronize you anymore. You were... No, exactly. You know. Yeah, that's interesting. And um, so from, from Carmen, is that when you met Ira and Red? I mean, or Red first? And how did that come about? Because well, that came, that came about because when I was playing with Carmen and staying on that guy's floor, his name was Birch, is Birch Johnson. He's a great trombone player, very successful trombone player. And that building that they lived in Jeff Hirschfield lived in that building. Um, Tom Whaley, do you know Tom Whaley? Or drummer, yeah. Tom lived in that building. Benny Wallace's friend, I think. Maybe. Right, and I uh, a lot of a Wait, lot of music. That was like the musicians' building, you know, and it's still there. Where was it exactly? Four Forty Tenth Avenue. It's like on Tenth Avenue. <coughs> excuse me, just north of Thirty Fourth Street. Oh, Thirty Fourth Street, yeah. Uh, Sam Rivers for a while had his studio Ribby, Ribby or whatever it was called, like down there in yeah. the bottom floor. And uh, Eric Turkel, all these musicians lived in there. And so to answer your question, I would do all these sessions when I was on Birch Johnson's floor across the hall, 10 feet at Tom Whaley's apartment. 
and all these people would come through and that's where I met Gary Dial at, at a session there. And Gary, you know, we connected musically and personally. There's and, another long relationship that you've had. You yeah, know. and that's that's where I met Gary. And um, you know, he's you know, he was playing with Red and Ira at that time with Tom Whaley, who was the drummer. Yeah, I believe I he was the first cat I heard of them. Yeah, and it's it, they were kind of looking for a bass player. I forget who was uh, Paul Burner was the bass player, and he left whatever. And um, Gary said, "Would you like? Would you be interested?" And I was like, "Yeah." So I still lived in Long Beach, California, and for like two years, I can't. Uh, you know how how lucky I am. They actually flew me. There was no bread, but they would fly me back and forth to to New York, and we played at the Vanguard like three times a year. Mm -hmm. And we toured all the time. And I ended up playing with Red for like 14 years or something. And Ira was there for ten, uh, eight or 10 of it. And that's where I met Ira. And that's where Gary, like, you know, was writing all those tunes. And we were nominated for a bunch of Grammys. And and uh, it was a oddly kind of a popular band. Um, yeah. Steve Bagby played drums and Ira and Red, who went back to... Uh, you know, days in uh, I get late forties, I think, or early fifties. Yeah, like, the Red Arrow. They did that Red Arrow record, right. and um, so you know, and they were you know again just fate, and so lucky that these guys took me under their wings. I, I look at both Red and Ira like Uncle Red and Uncle Ira, you know, and um, it's so supportive, and you know, it was crazy shit that went on in those days you know with those guys but you guys um, were really you were you were traveling in a in a van as i recall you know in a, oh yeah you know with red talking about uh uh bird and ira about train and you know so much was going on and we're like bouncing around in the back of a van and it's not until i mean and we would talk to red about bird and all that but um you know it, it were in my station in life now, I was like, man, I wish Red was around so I could have those conversations again and like like an, uh, an intelligent grown up instead of um, a kid bouncing around in a van, you know. I understand. <clears throat> and Red had like some great jokes too. Oh, you he know, was the two of them. Are... He was really a good joke was... teller. And was... you guys had one story. I don't know if you you may remember. I think Ira might have told me this, but it had to do with Gerard um, D'Angelo. Gerard D'Angelo's grandmother. Oh, you told me this another when we did the thing for Ira. I don't remember that, but okay, I won't tell it. <laughs> I mean, I remember you telling a story. I remember. I don't remember the specifics of the story. But... Yeah, no, that was uh, just because I think Gary told it to me. Either you know. But it was rather funny. Right? Okay. But um, yeah, you know, I mean, well, I mean, Naira, you know, was a big factor in my life, and I know I sat in with you guys a few times at the Vanguard and that, and I, I just um, when I was in Boston, Ira didn't make a, a a gig, and it was at the Hasty Pudding Club in Cambridge, so I uh, played that one night, and. Uh, <clears throat> I had just gotten the tenor. I hadn't really played much tenor yet. And Red said, oh, I want you to play some tenor. Of course we would. Of and, course. Then, and then the whole gig, I, you know, it was just that one night. So that whole night, I, I was looking forward because I never really worked with Red. And he made me, I sight read all those tunes that night. One after, the only tune I knew that they played, that you played the whole night, besides we played a blues. I think we played Chi Chi. And other than that, or it may have been a different blues. But um, we played How About You. And other than that, everything was uh, Gary's tunes. Right. For the most part. And, you know, I felt bad because I didn't think I really did justice to them. You know, I, I did my best. No, you, did, you did great. I, 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 we talk, we've talked about this. And I remember that. And I didn't know until years later that you were uncomfortable or that, you know, the, the, that gig from your perspective. But... You know, I was just like, wow, I'm playing with Bob Mover. You know, uh, we were all just kind of thrilled, you know. That's funny. I was like, <laughs> all I told myself through that whole gig was, I'm failing, I'm failing. 
Uh, yeah. You know, but thank you guys. You guys were very supportive, you know, and, you know, I remember also having some nice times with you guys with Dick Oates too. Right. Yeah. And I should, I should mention Dick because Dick, when, when Ira split, you know, he, he was in Miami and we were gone a lot, you know, I think he needed to be home more and, um, uh, you know, he had kids and his wife and he was trimming trees and playing jazz and, right. you know, he, he wanted to be home. So then Dick Oates kind of uh, filled that spot. Yeah, I was glad for him. And then I, you know, I think this, this you know, but you stayed with Red for about another year after that, right? A year I ago. stayed with Red until I think 92. Yeah, I mean, we did it with Dick, Dick for a few years, you know. And then, and then Chris Potter, uh, he, you know, it wasn't people Jay. don't know, but Red is the one that kind of, I mean, Chris, of course, would have had a, an amazing career with or without Red or anybody else. But uh, Red is the one that heard this kid in North Carolina, I think North Carolina. Yeah. That, and uh, he said, man, this, you know, I want to bring him up to New York. And he just said, I'm playing somewhere. And he, uh, you know, brought him up and. The rest is history. You I know. think he brought, brought James Morrison up from Australia, too. Yep. Yep. James. So, you know, Jay, as we were mentioning earlier, you, you have all of these recordings, I mean, on many labels, but especially this uh, 60, around the area of 60 recordings on Steeplechase. It's actually, it's actually about double that. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Believe it or not, you know. I, I, I believe it. Yeah. And so I was, you know, wondering how... Because I think were you you know you were sort of like a you almost looked like the house bass player. I know. You recorded with so many people. How did that association come about? And were you in fact like sometimes did you go in and play with people that you might not have known too well before, but yet uh, the label arranged that the situation? Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how that stuff gets going? Sure. You know, well, um, a quick aside. You know, I, I have found playing music, and I'm sure you can relate, you know, it's like, especially when you're a bass player, rhythm section player, um, you know, you meet tons of musicians and, you know, I feel like I always, I never embarrass myself, let's say that, but you're not gonna, I'm not gonna be the bass player of choice for every piano player or tenor player in New York, you know, so, um, I've, I've built these associations and very early on Nils was recording Red, Rodney. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, we did some record, I think those were the first recordings I did with Red for Steeplechase. And I got along with Nils and um, Nils Winter, the uh, head of the label. And um, so, so then throughout the years, um, many of the people, Rich Perry, Vic, um, several others would just hire me. Tables and, uh, George, right. you know, actually Nils hooked me up with George. You asked, you know, some of the people I knew and then Nils actually, you know, I did, I think four or five George Cables records and, uh, Nils is the one that uh, recommended me the first time, and then George was generous to have me back on the other occasions. Same thing with Paul Blay, um, you know, who was one of my idols, you know. And so when Nils said, "Do you want to do a Paul Blay record?" I was like, "Oh my God!" You know, like, <laughs> and, it, and it's funny. Just a quick anecdote: I saw, and my friend, God bless him, Frank Kimbrough, who was good friends with Paul. Um, saw a video of Paul doing a workshop, I think at New England Conservatory, the night before I recorded the first record with them. So the, the students were saying, well, you know, when you do, a, there, there was a Q&A with Paul and um, one of the students asked the question, so like you're, you're doing this record tomorrow in New York, do you know these people? Or I mean, how, how, does, how, how does a record happen, you know? And Paul was like, well, you know, I record for ECM and I, you know, did these Jimmy Jufy records and this, and, you know, he talked talk about his history. And he goes, but, you know, with Steeplechase, they hire the guys I show up. He, he basically made it sound like it was a way for him to make a quick buck. But, yeah, well, 
And so he said, yeah, like the drummer is Adam Nussbaum. You know, he's, you know, he plays with the Brecker brothers and all this other shit. And, you know, he's probably going to play really loud. And bass player, I don't even know who he is. Um, but it doesn't matter. You know, I'll do my thing with or without him, you know. And and so so I saw that about four five years ago. And it was just amazing to see what his thoughts were on me the night before my first record with him. <laughs> but uh, to my credit, you know, I ended up doing about five other records with him. And, um, you know, some of the, you know, we did a record called Notes on Ornette. And it's an amazing record. We did it in about two and a half hours. And... Um, you know, it was we all Jeff Hirschfield played drums and we all knew it was like a special thing that happened, you know. So Nils was like, Well, Paul, you wanna he he lived up in Cooperstown in New York, you know, and he, he said, Paul, why don't you stay in uh Well Paul lived in Cherry Valley. Is is that like around yeah, that was the place I, yeah, he was my daughter's godfather, so I've got some Oh, later. okay. Yeah. So he uh so Nils said, Oh, why don't you stick around? Let's just do another record really quick. And Nils was like, no, I got to train at Grand Central. I'm out of here. So so anyway, we did a, rec a, a record with, uh, I think I did three or four um, trio records. We did a record with Rich Perry and um, one with Lee Konitz. You know, so my point was going to be before that you meet these people in your life that... <clears throat> kind of bringing it back to the, one of the first things you said, who feel like you're the person to play their music, whether it was Vic for me or Mar uh, Maria Schneider or Bob Mincer or Rich Perry. <coughs> um, did a lot of records with Lynn Ariel. A lot of, several people that I'm fortunate to have had long associations with. And Nils Winter was not a musician, but he had this, has this label and he was somebody who um, believed in me and I think knew <clears throat> that uh, I would show up. You know, I, 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 I've been on maybe 500 records and I would say 400 of those were just show up to the studio and either calling tunes or here's my originals. And so I'm a, I'm a pretty quick study. And so Nils, I guess, knew that and appreciated that in me. And so, uh, you know, over these last, you know it better, whatever that year of those Red Rodney records, but I guess it was probably the late the 90s. 80s, early 90s. I've been doing records ever since and for, for Steeplechase and played a lot of, a lot of great music. Uh, thank you to Nils, you know. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful. You know, I mean, I'm... I never, I never met him, but I'm looking forward to uh, meeting him because I've got to talk to him about something. But um, the thing is, uh, Blake is a funny story. You know, Paul, um, my daughter, my daughter Emily, my oldest daughter, who's a very good singer songwriter and wonderful musician herself, guitar player, um, has two godfathers, one of which is, is Paul. Wow. And uh, I met Blake. <laughs> And you, you'll like this, I think, it, it, the Musicians' Union used to have these things at Roseland on Wednesdays. I, he I heard about those. I never went, but I heard about yeah, it. Well, people would go there, like, trying to pick up a stray club date, or and in one corner you'd have the um, Cuban uh, and uh, Latin Latin musicians. In another corner you'd have, um, you know, the, uh, the club date musicians who work for Lester Lannon and those agencies, you know, Eddie Duchin and that type of thing. And then also the jazz musicians would be in another corner and people would page each other. You right. Know? So your name would be heard. I say, Jay, could you go up and page me? You know, and I'll page you. Oh. So, so then somebody would say, ah, Jay Anderson, I've heard the name. You know, and they do that. It was a typical thing. Now, sometimes it was really weird. You would find people like Lee Konitz and Paul Blay would be at the union on a Wednesday afternoon. It's like a mixer for musicians, right? Yeah, it's sort of like a mixer, but only if you're, you know, you're not gonna really pick up a jazz gig there. That's the funny thing. You're gonna pick up a club date. I mean, a, a wedding, a bar mitzvah, you know, something like that, or a, a Latin gig or, or whatever it is, you know? So 
I was hanging out at the union one day and mainly I would sit in the corner with Bill Rubenstein and uh, Bill Rubenstein, great piano player, and some of the other uh, cats, the bass player, Nabi Otoda. <laughs> and, you know, Bill Crow might be there and various cats would be sitting there and he'd be sitting there not really expecting much to shake. Shake and, you know, and I noticed one guy, I said, that looks like Paul Blay. I only knew him from a record cover, you know, or two. Right. But I, I said, I think it is Paul Blay. So I went over and talked to him. And, you know, we started to, I introduced myself, he introduced himself. And uh, he said to me, we started talking. I told him I was good friends with Konitz and had played with Mingus and that kind of thing. And uh, he said, uh, people talk about playing to create. Did you ever play to destroy? <laughs> that sounds, sounds like something he would say. He was such a contrarian, you know. A contrarian, you know, and he was like, and we we actually became very good friends. And I go up and stay with him in Cherry Valley, with my family, we would, you know. And I knew his wife Carol and his daughters. And I knew them since they were born. And uh, we would stay up all night and talk and not agree a lot of the time. But it was great. He loved to to uh, actually to disagree was fun. And we would we would have uh, you know like little uh, little things. But you know he told me one time he said Bobby, and I did this one record of free jazz with him and John Abercrombie, which was under my name. And we called it uh, The Night Bathers. And, wow. uh, you know, but uh, Blake convinced me to do it. I thought we were gonna play some standards, which I like to play with him, but he didn't really, you know, he did, did do some of that later with Chet and with Conan, as a matter of fact. Yeah. He persuaded me to play free. He would say, Bobby, join the avant-garde. It's where the money is. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, one other story of him. So I used to I used to kid him um, when I lived in Montreal for a while. I got out of the city and took a gig teaching in Montreal. And oh right there, yeah, because my my daughter was being born, and I didn't want to be in New York, and I just wanted to concentrate on being a dad and that kind of thing for the first couple of years at least, till she was old enough to know why I went away when I travel. And Paul told me he said, "Man, you're leaving New York." You go into Montreal. I said, well, it's pretty close, Canada. You know, you get there. He said, man, you might as well go to Australia. Once you leave New York, you're out of everybody's minds. You're not there anymore. And he was right. Uh -huh. But in the meantime, his mother died and they sold her place. So he started to get his mail at my house in Montreal. Oh, wow. So he'd come up there. He had to settle his mother's estate. This all happened. And and the mail was coming to my house. And I happened to notice that his real name, you know, he was an adopted child. And, oh, I, I didn't know that. Yeah. And his real name was Hyman Blay. Oh. Hyman Paul Blay. And- uh, So Paul I, was his middle name. I think so. You know, because I did see, yeah, official documents that said Hyman Paul Blay. And uh, so I would say, so tell me, Jaime, how are, how are things in the avant-garde business? <laughs> did he did he find it humorous? Oh, very humorous. He liked that, you know, because I would, because he was uh, my business coach. He, I mean, uh, he was the reason I worked for twenty years. He told me there's only five people. He said there's ten people in Europe, and you just he said you have a nice personality. People like you. He said make friends. He said who are they going to hire? They hire guys that can play. But they, if they've got five guys to, to choose from, and there's one cat that they really like to hang out with, he's right. going to get the gig. <laughs> and Blay would tell me, you've got better than average social skills. That's so you, funny. Should, you should own them. And, uh, you know, one other quick one with him that was really funny. When I met him, it turned out we both lived in the village. And so we got each other's numbers. <clears throat> so I, uh, this was, um, 1974, I think, 73, even maybe 73. And uh, Blaze said, yeah, man, we, you know, if we're neighbors, come on, call me up one day. We'll go out for a coffee or a glass of wine. And he, he lived on Jane Street, I think, and I was living uh -huh. on Thompson Street. So uh, I decided to call him up. So I had the number and I hear, hello. I said, oh, Paul, this is Bob Mover. We met uh, the other day. I hear, uh-huh, uh-huh. And, uh, you know, you mentioned that we might get together. Mm. And then I said, you know, uh, so I'm around and feel like. 
And then it said, you have been talking to a machine. <laughs> and this was the first answering machine I ever heard. And then the beep came and you were done. You'd like to talk to the real Paul Blay. <laughs> he explained it. Please leave your number and the real Paul Blay will get back to you. That's funny. Thank you very much. And that was, uh, you know, we started to hang out from there. Wow. And uh, I met Kimbrough too. When I went to see Paul at a recording session, he was doing with Peacock and uh, Motian. Oh, uh-huh. And Frank was there listening, and I was there listening, so that's when I met Frank. That's kind of where I met Frank, too, at a, at a Paul session. Huh. You know, I mean, we knew each other a little bit, but, uh, yeah, that's where we got to know each other. And then we played with Maria Schneider for many years. Now, that was, how did you... Uh, become part of that because you've really been a lot of on a lot of her music and <clears throat> you told me you couldn't do something and you kind of didn't play with her for a while well i just um you know i played on her first record and uh maybe I, i've told other people but, but very quickly you know you know bob belden do you remember him sure i remember belden and uh he had a band it was like a nonet or something like that and i i was in that band and um Maria would come to our gigs and I was like who's this gal that's coming to our gigs at Visione do you remember Visione's Visione's and um so it that's turned so out she was a composer and uh, she wanted to do a re recording and um uh so she asked me to do it and I was like and Frank and I have compared notes on this it's like well who is she you know sometimes you want to vet somebody before you play with them you know but she had no body of work because she wasn't really a, an instrumentalist she was more of a composer you know so anyway i uh uh agreed to do the record and it was with dennis mccrell and kenny werner and uh, scott robinson and rick margitz a lot of great players and that was her first record called evanescence and um so it came out maybe a i, I don't think she had a record deal i think she had to shop it around and finally Enja picked it up and put it out and then it had some success and but before it had some success she got this gig at Visiones and I had just gotten married and it was in 92 and I kind of had just bought this house upstate and I wanted to be up here on a Monday night you know and uh, with my wife so I said you know what I think you better find somebody else to play in the band so she got tony share great bass player and he did it for a couple of years a few years maybe five years and eventually she asked me if i would come back and i you know at that point i had been married for four or five years and had this house and i was ready to be more in new york so i uh uh said yes and it was a record of hers called concert in the garden and uh so i've been with her ever since you know and she's you know i i love playing her music and i love the people in the band and um and as i've said other times um you know she's one of those people like mills winter or rich perry or Vic Juris or frank kimbrough or bob mincer or whoever the people that i've had long associations with it just kind of believe in you and your ability to uh, bring what you do to their music i would like to think it's not just because i'm a guy holding the bass but because of uh, what i contribute to their musical vision and maria is like at the top of that list you know she's you know, I still play with her. vision yeah 